Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. AMD's CES conference was pretty damn interesting. Naturally, the company unveiled a ton of stuff, including details of their AM5 platform, the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D, as well as some stuff on GPUs as well. Honestly, it's pretty cool what we have coming from all three companies right now, but yeah, AMD's Frank Aza actually provided us some further details and clarifications compared to what was at their CES event. So I want to go through some of the talking points that he had. I also want to credit Hot Hardware, who had the interview with Frank. I'll, of course, link it in the video description down below, although it is a pretty long interview. So I just want to go over a couple of very interesting points, at least in my personal opinion. So one question a number of us had was why AMD chose to release the Vcash version of their processors with just the 5800. So we have, of course, eight cores, 16 threads, and it is pretty much the same specifications as what we had with the 5800X, albeit now, of course, you've got this Vcache, which is bolted on to vastly increase the amount of cache on the chip. And honestly, the performance results that AMD have shown is pretty damn impressive. According to Frank, there were several reasons that they've chosen to do this. The first is that this is apparently aimed towards, predominantly anyway, gamers at the moment. And obviously games don't necessarily take advantage of more than 8 cores slash 16 threads. Furthermore, he did state that Vcache is an expensive technology. And obviously there are also heat and power consumption things to bear in mind as well. In fact, we've actually seen the 5800X 3D with a slight clock frequency retrogression compared to the standard chip. Now, honestly, this is not going to be too much of a big deal. And until we actually get the processor and are actually testing it, we don't really know how it's going to perform. Remember, it's not going to release for a while yet. It's going to be essentially in... Uh, in spring. But the final thing he did say on this, actually, is that he wants to see how, or rather AMD wants to see how the technology is adopted. I can kind of imagine also that there are some manufacturing limitations as well. At the end of the day, you know, when you actually start to think of how many SKUs, how many different products are being produced on TSMC's 7NM process for AMD, you know, there's only a certain finite amount of manufacturing capability. I also want to read this part out verbatim. I mean, from a thermal perspective, from a power perspective and so on, we are within 105 watts, so the performance uplift that Vcash is providing significantly outweighs the frequency. And again, something's going to go. And that's the high-level explanation I can give, he says. Basically, to my personal understanding from what I've been hearing from sources, and obviously this is not part of the interview, I basically have been hearing that, you know, this is essentially to counter Old Lake's gaming advantage, right? However, AMD will also, of course, be launching Zen 4 later this year. We'll be discussing more about that in just a moment. And this is in an effort to thwart, well... Intel because they're of course releasing Raptor Lake which is going to see modest IPC gains and also some clock frequency adjustments as well but as for the AM5 platform well yeah according to what we're learning here it's not going to just be like a single one and done processor release one of the real highlights of AM4 at least in my personal opinion was the life cycle of it. Now, obviously there were limitations, especially because of BIOS chip sizes in the early days. So that's something to be aware of. You know, some of the older 300 series boards, for example, you know, there was definitely a shelf life of them and there were some frustrations there. But generally speaking, like if you have a 400 series board, you're good to go. And you can certainly put in one of these uh, 5800X3Ds. And I personally think this is a really, really, really big positive for AMD. It's definitely been a fairly forward thinking platform. And actually, let me know, guys, down below, was the, you know, AM4 platform a big reason for you to kind of move towards AMD? I know several people who have actually told me that one of the big reasons that they're sticking with AMD is the length of time that the company are sticking with the platform. Obviously, you know, it kind of depends on your perspective on this. I think it's quite interesting because obviously with the adoption now of uh, DDR5 and a number of uh, new technologies like PCIe Gen 5, the industry is kind of forced to switch. But previous to that, it wasn't. So it's it's kind of an interesting time in the market. But anyway, switching to what Frank tells us here, he says, and I quote, that's just in the next couple of years. We are looking at things three, four plus years from now. 
I can't give you a comment on the longevity of the socket because I don't want to give anyone a commitment, but I can tell you that we're at the point where you hit a brick wall and how far you can go. And AM4 is amazing, it's amazing, and how far I've been able to bring it. We've got a socket for four to five years and hopefully you'll be able to accomplish something similar with AM5. The other guys give you a socket for like a year, maybe two. So that total cost of ownership with the AM4 or AM5, there's just nothing that compares to it. And we know transitions are always tough. We understand that, but I hope people can maintain the perspective and appreciate what we're accomplishing. Another thing too is a lot of people were asking why AMD chose to outfit their latest graphics card, which of course is the 6500 XT, with four gigabytes of memory. And obviously it's quite interesting because the market at the moment, you know, PR wise, it's definitely a big win to have more RAM. However, according to their own testing, there wasn't a huge amount of difference in uh, basically 1080p medium or high settings, particularly when you are utilizing technology like FSR. Now, one of the things that AMD will be releasing pretty soon is a driver update for RSR. I already covered this more in depth, but essentially it's FSR, but a driver level toggle. And NVIDIA have already done this with NIS. So I actually covered this pretty in depth. Uh, it's still utilizing Lanchos for NIS. And basically, yeah, it's pretty similar for what AMD have done with RSR. In my personal opinion, it's excellent that we are starting to see this as a driver level toggle because clearly it means that that way a game developer doesn't necessarily have to do any work. You can just choose to do it. And this is excellent for owners of slightly older GPUs. For example, let's say um, you have like a GTX 1060 or a 1070 and you're playing a game that doesn't even support DLSS or it doesn't even support FSR, you're still good to go with NVIDIA's drivers. So in my personal opinion, this is excellent that AMD are doing much the same. But yeah, essentially this is one of the reasons that they're doing this, that they want to put out a card that's about 200 bucks and they want it to be readily available, not appealing to miners. Now, there are some interesting things regarding the um, GPU. I want to give credit to 3D Center, who actually did a pretty big um, comparison point between all of the different features between Narve 24, 3, 22, and finally, of course, 21. And basically, one of the things that seems to be missing for Narve 24, which of course, again, is cards like the 6500 XT, would be AV1 decoding and also um, encoding uh, H264, uh, 4K and H26, uh, sorry, 265 as well. So basically it's missing. Furthermore, PCIe Express support is limited to just four lanes of 4.0. And yeah, I mean, when it comes to the support of the encoding decoding, it technically speaking would actually cost AMD a couple of pennies to basically implement this. And really, I believe, and I, I don't know this, I don't want to speak on behalf of their engineers, but I have to guess that essentially this is because the chip is really kind of a mobile GPU, essentially plonked into a discrete form. And this is a GPU that definitely would find its way into laptops and stuff and be an excellent product for that. And, you know, something like a Decode AV1, for example, is a kind of, you know, thing that you would generally expect to be in like a you know a, a, um sorry in an apu because you know when you're using a laptop or something like that you don't really want the discrete gpu to be doing that because of power reasons so it does kind of suck that it's not implemented in the desktop implementation as for the limitations on the pcie lanes again it's only four rather than like a 16 implementation I mean, at the end of the day, we haven't tested it independently yet, which is, of course, really the, you know, the the litmus test, so to speak. Like, yeah, I, I personally don't think on a, on a Gen 4 interface, it's going to make that much of a difference. Whether or not in some select scenarios, if it's on a Gen 3 interface, it matters much, I don't know. And it would be interesting to do, like, comparisons of the same system. Um, just for example, if you had, like, a 5950X and you benchmarked, with it on Gen 4 versus Gen 3, it would be interesting to see, uh, just, you know, to see what type of frame rate differences there are. 
clearly, you know, the Gen 4 interface being limited to four lanes is not for the reason of mining or rather mining prevention because, you know, PCIe bandwidth speeds are not necessarily something that miners would give a rat's ass about, at least to my understanding. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong down below, but, you know, I think a lot of the time miners use like uh, risers, which have like, I think it might be like a, a times one or something like that connection. Um, that's for memory, so don't crucify me too much in the comments. But yeah, uh, basically miners are, you know, not really going to be affected by this. I believe it's just kind of the the remnants, if you will, of the, you know, the original design of the GPU. But it, it would be interesting for them to kind of be tested more extensively. But yeah, I mean, just to kind of round things off with the interview here, Frank does mention that possibly there will be 8 gigabyte uh, comparisons as well. But, uh, sorry, 8 gigabyte versions as well, which does mean that, you know, if gamers in theory want to buy that card, they could, uh, but they, of course, then would be competing with the mining crowd as well. But, yeah, I mean, he kind of puts it like this. Every graphics card uh, has been hated in the last couple of years, so I hope we nail this one down and people will love us for it. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, and I've said this a trillion times now in videos, while I do believe that, um, you know, the high-end products are amazing, like I recently just reviewed um, the 12400 from Intel, and I think that this kind of encapsulates this pretty well, you know, the mid to low range products are, in my personal opinion, perhaps actually more exciting. And when it also comes to, like, iGPUs, we're starting to really see, like, um, this this incredible amount of performance on APUs going forward. Um, I actually tested a mini PC from Morphine, and the performance of that is pretty impressive. Sure, you know, it is based on Vega, um, you know, for the iGPU, but even so, it's kind of weird that with FSR, you can actually make something like Resident Evil uh, Village pretty playable, honestly, and to me, that's 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 insanely cool. But with that said, thank you very much for checking out this video. If you have enjoyed it, then of course you can leave a likey on the video, and I will see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.